Hey, how's it going guys? I hope that this video finds you well as always. Uh, in this video we are going to be talking about evolution through natural selection and a little bit about genetic evolution as well. Uh, we're going to be looking at some vocabulary that will help you understand these two terms a little bit better. Okay, so the objective here is to be able to analyze and evaluate the relationship of natural selection to adaptations and to the development of diversity in and among species. All right, so some key words that we want to highlight here is uh, obviously natural selection, adaptations, which we probably already know what that is. Um, diversity is another one that we need to make sure that we understand. All right, maybe species we want to highlight it as well, but I'm also pretty sure that you know what species mean. So this is the objective for today. If you want to make that into an essential question, here I have a language objective. Uh, it says that students will be able to apply the appropriate evolutionary vocabulary in reading questions, uh, basically you can write, can I uh, apply the appropriate evolutionary vocabulary in reading questions. I'm going to make that a question mark at the end. So what we're going to do is we want to go through some vocabulary and hopefully by the end of this video you can apply this vocabulary to some, some uh, questions that we will have to answer. All right. So a little bit about the history of evolution through natural selection. Uh, these are two of the key figures, the key um, people who are quoted for the uh, work on natural selection. Um, this man on the left here, um, Alfred Russell Wallace, very well known for his work on the origin of species, together with this one who most of you probably already know, Charles Darwin, who is coined as the father of evolution. Um, through natural selection. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the history of evolution, uh, which is quite a remarkable one, uh, but if you want, you can always look up some information about um, the history of evolution, which is quite remarkable. All right, now we're going to go over some vocabulary, like I said, and make sure that you write down the word, and then we apply some definitions to those words. The first one is evolution, and very important word that we need to understand the meaning of. It basically means the change in the genetic composition of a population of organisms from generation to generation. Okay, if you want to make that a little simpler, it basically means change in a population over time. Okay, something that is important to understand here is that uh, populations of organisms uh, over a long, long period of time have evolved different traits and different characteristics that have helped them survive in their environment. All right, so. The next thing that we need to know is pop the word population, and it says here that a group of organisms of the same species. So we talked about this before, just a group of organisms that they're all the same species. We want to coin that uh, the word population. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that organisms on their own cannot evolve. Okay, there's not one single organism that during their lifespan can evolve, but rather uh, evolution happens in uh, a group of organisms, obviously, uh, or the population of those organisms over a long period of time, and I'm talking millions or even billions of years. So rather those with better suited traits survive to pass them on to their offspring. So those traits are better suited for an environment will be passed on to offsprings because obviously those are the organisms that will be able to survive more frequently. But organisms itself don't uh, evolve, rather populations of organisms evolve over a long, long period of time. Um, another word that we need to know the definition of is the word allele. And an allele is basically the variation of a gene for a given trait. Uh, we normally represent this with letters. So we talked about this before uh, when we talked about genetics. And this is a word that is going to come back again uh, for the topic of evolution, the word allele. Okay, so just to keep that in mind, remember that these are present in our genes, in our chromosomes, as different variations. So we have sometimes here the variation for purple color, which can be represented with a capital A. The variation for white color can be represented with a uh, lowercase a. Excuse me. So these are all different variations of a gene uh, that are given for any specific trait. Okay. So this one is a new one that we never talked about before, the word gene pool. Uh, and gene pool basically is all of the available genes or genetic, inf uh, or genetic information within a population. 
So if you get all of the alleles, all of the alleles for a given population, all of those alleles combined for any given gen uh, genotype, all of those alleles will make up what we call uh, the gene pool for a, for a population of individuals. Okay, so the next one is the word natural selection. And natural selection is one mechanism uh, for evolution. It's not the only mechanism of evolution, but this topic is all about natural selection. So this is a very, very important mechanism for evolution or changes in a population gene pool. So a lot of the times we tend to think about evolution um, or natural selection, excuse me, as survival of the fetus. Now, don't confuse survival of the fetus with those who are stronger will be able to survive and thus reproduce. Okay, that's not exactly what natural selection is all about. But rather, survival of the fetus means those organisms with traits that are well suited to an environment are more likely to survive and produce offspring who will have those traits. So, for example, these are two different uh, animals here. The Arctic fox, for example, has traits that allow them to survive to their environment. So obviously they live in the Arctic, which is pretty cold. Some of the traits that they may have, maybe that the white coat help them uh, camouflage, the short ears might help them. Um, uh, the thicker coat, as you can see, obviously for uh, the temperature. Now this one right here is a des desert fox, and he looks very, very different from the Arctic fox. It has different traits that obviously allows it to survive and be more fit to its environment. So like the, the longer ears, maybe help them here for a longer distance. Um, obviously there's not a lot of hair or a lot of coat um, because it's a lot uh, hotter in the desert. So survival of the fetus again is talking about those organisms that have better traits, not necessarily stronger traits, but better traits that are suited to an environment. Those are the ones that will survive, okay? So uh, this is a very good example, the peppered moth. Okay, the peppered moth is a good example because uh, moth are, were naturally selected based on the color of the tree trunks. So whenever um, this moth will hang out around the trees, trees that were darker, uh, that had darker trunks, well, the only moth that you will see around those trees are those that had that darker form or that look a lot darker. However, whenever, um, it came time for the winter, the only moth that you will see are those that were white. And that's because they were better selected to their environment. Those that were darker will obviously camouflage a lot better um, around darker trunks. And if there were any type of predators like birds or small mammals, those um, that were whiter will be eaten and those that were darker will not be seen. Now, if um, imagine if the forest was covered in snow, you would know that these that are water will have a better chance to survive than those that were darker. And that's a very, very good example just to see how two different colors uh, can mean, uh, can be natural, naturally selected uh, to survive over the other. Okay? So this is a very good picture of what it looks like. If you notice, obviously, right now the trunks are dark. So the black moth will have an advantage, it will be better suited. It will um, be better suited for their environment than the ones that were white. And so these are the ones that are going to be able to pass their genes to the next generation of moth. All right, they'll be able to um, reproduce more often, obviously. So another word is the word adaptation. Make sure that you write this uh, definition. It is a variation of its rate that contributes to an organism's chance uh, for or of survival, okay? Sometimes we call these desired traits, uh, but they're not quite desired by the organism, but they're desired for the environment, all right? Um, what I mean is, the, for example, this example of the camel here, the camel doesn't desire to have this home that allows it to store a lot of water uh, over a long period of time. It didn't really desire that. It just happened over a long period of time. It was an adaptation that it developed over a long period of time, like this rabbit here in the snow. Uh, obviously, the snow is white. The rabbit has a white coat. 
it didn't really desire to have that white code. It didn't really want it to have that white code. It just happened randomly. Uh, and since it is better suited for the environment, obviously those rabbits were better able to survive and pass on their traits to the next generation. Okay. Uh, the next word is the word fitness. And fitness is a really interesting word because it means that organisms that survive will produce more frequently, will reproduce more frequently, I'm sorry, and will have more offspring. So those organisms that will have more offspring uh, and more frequent offspring, those are the ones that are going to be more fit for their environment. So it says here that organisms that produce more surviving offsprings are more fit over those that produce fewer offspring. So in this example here, um, these organisms, they say that you have green and brown uh, bugs. So if you have green and brown and there were birds that will only eat the green ones, Obviously, the ones that are more fit are the brown ones over the green ones. And that's because they can uh, or they will be able to pass on their genes to the next generation. Not necessarily because they will survive, but because they will pass their genes to the next generation of bugs. And so you will end up with more and more and more uh, brown bugs rather than those green ones. Okay, so you will kind of experience what we call a change in the gene pool. Those alleles for green will start to decrease while those alleles for uh, brown will start to increase. And that's where allele frequency comes into play. Now, allele frequency basically uh, means how frequent an allele is observed or is present in a given population. And I decided to use the pepper moth as an example because it's very, very simple. Uh, so you can find the allele frequency or how often a gene shows up. Now the dominant allele frequency will be given by the number of dominant uh, alleles in the gene pool over, and I have to put this right here, over the total number of alleles. So for example, here you have little b, little b, big b, big b, little b, little b, big b, little b, and uh, little b, big, uh, big b, little b little bit, little bit. So the total number of alleles uh, or the gene pool that we have here uh, is composed of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, whoops, 12 total alleles. So that is our gene pool. Now, how many of them are big B? That will be the frequency for our uh, dominant allele. So we have 1, 2, three and four out of 12 total that are going to be uh, dominant. And then if we count the recessive alleles, which is the number of recessive alleles in a gene pool over the total number of alleles, that will be the frequency for the recessive allele. So if we count again out of the 12 that we have, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight out of 12 is going to be your allele frequency for the recessive allele. So here you have uh, two different allele frequencies, one for the dominant allele and one for the recessive allele. All right, so I think I'm going to stop here, but before that, oh, I have a little bit more just to review genetic uh, vocabulary. Just um, make sure that you understand this. Uh, there are three genotypes of a trait. You have these three different ones, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive, so those determine your genotype, all right? Then just one single letter is your allele. And if you want to have five pepper moth, for example, and you need to understand that this right here will be your gene pool, the allele frequency for the dominant allele will be however many dominant alleles you have. So one, two, three, four, five dominant alleles versus one, two, three, four, five recessive allele. So dominant will be 50% allele frequency and recessive will be 50% allele frequency. Um, this is where I wanted to get just the exit ticket. Uh, we're going to answer these two questions. If you want, you can stop here and start thinking about them because at the end of the class, we will uh, be answering these questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop this video now, guys. Make sure that you answer all the questions and that you have a summary for your um, Cornell notes. And I will see you on the next video. See you later.